everyone. Um, thank you so much for being with us this evening. Um, I am like awed and honored and so grateful to be in conversation with um, five of my favorite artists and humans. And the first that I will be talking to is the amazing uh, Kristen Arnett. <laughs> Hi, Hello. Steve. Hello. Hello. Thank you for having yeah. me. This is a, a wild experiment in virtual programming that you all are about to witness. And so hopefully it will be, it will be thrilling and cool um, and, and, and interesting. Um, and not, as opposed to like bewildering. Um, so the format with each writer is going to be, I'm going to ask them, um, these brilliant writers of short fiction and novels, a question about the short story as a form, and they're going to ask me a question in kind. And um, so, Kristen, I was just thinking back to when I first read Felt in the Jaw, and I was so struck um, by the voice and the quality of perception. And I think about, there's this line from your story, Notice of a Fourth Location, that I, th I think about this bit all the time where you have this description of a character who turns up in a pink velour tracksuit in bright white sneakers, the kind that they look, that look like they'd been scrubbed clean with a toothbrush. And I swear, I think about that every time I see someone in really clean, like I just imagine them at home scrubbing them with a toothbrush, all because of your story. So good. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us about a short story been a significant influence on your work. Yeah. First of all, this is like a really great question. Also really difficult. I was like, oh my God. I mean, as, I mean, as writers who love short fiction as form, I think it can be really difficult to choose one. But probably like the first one that came to mind for me is Joy Williams' The Skater which is one of my favorite, uh, favorite, favorite, fa I mean, Joy Williams, obviously, but that story uh, for me, thinking about it um, in terms of like the context of like what short fiction can do, it is, I think in the book, like maybe 13 pages total, like total pages and does, I think more in those 13 pages oftentimes than I see happen in novels. Um, in terms of like world building, in terms of character building, in terms of uh, just tenderness and vulnerability within like the space of three separate characters. So I went back and I wanna like let everybody know about this. Like I went back to like read it. It's like also a story I read, um, the first time I read it, I read it like piecemeal. I read it like online. I actually read it like, I said this is a librarian, illegally. I read it illegally on the internet, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> It was one of those ones where I went to go look it up again. It came out like originally in like 1984 in Esquire. Um, you can look it up now and read it legally uh, <laughs> if you don't have the book. But I was looking at it again and so much of what that story does is based on these three characters who are, right? It's a two parents and a daughter and they're taking the daughter to check out boarding schools in the opposite side of the country because one of the uh, other, like they had another daughter who has died. And the daughter sits in the background throughout the rest of the story, right? Like the characters revolve around her and like her, the fact that she's missing and what that grief looks like throughout it. And in like 13 pages, you find out so much about these three characters through the ways that they process grief around the person who's not there. Um, and just the, the, the small lines and the ways that things happen in that story, like there's a part where the mother Annie puts her hand, she's in the bathroom and she's listening to her daughter laugh at something with her husband. And she puts her hand against the window frame to hear, feel the cold air coming in along the window frame and then like washes her hands again. And these like very small little intimate moments in that story for me, it, it feels like the epitome of what I think of like when I think of like the snow globe of short fiction, right? Like the contained world yeah. of the short story. Um, that to me is like, it's like, here's the entire contained world in the snow globe, plus like the idea, right? Like the skater itself, like it ends up on the ice at the end of it. It's just so beautiful. But that probably is a story. I, I think about the story constantly. I think about like the people in it. I think about every time I read it, I discover something different and it's not even that long. So I think that that's a story that has influenced me um, not only as a writer of short fiction, but as a reader of short fiction, because it's, it's does so much with so 
an economy of words, an economy of language that is so beautiful. Yeah, I love her work yeah. so much. And I think it's like she can write these stories that are really uh, compact, almost like terse, you know, but there's this like unfathomable mystery to them. And at the same time, like they're very sharp, you know, there's nothing sort of opaque about them. But that was me who just gave us like this amazing mini essay on, uh, on a <laughs> story. She's like, that alone has, has made my night. Ah, well, now I get to ask you a question. So yes, now the, ta I know. the tables are the, ta the tables are turned. Yeah, I'm ready. You. Cheers for this, because honestly, the book, as everyone's going to say tonight, is gorgeous. All of the stories are beautiful. It's like an amazing collection. I like was so struck. First of all, it's only the second time I've ever cried on a plane reading a book. Oh. <laughs> reading. <laughs> especially like reading a uh, volcano house, which is my favorite story from that collection. That story, I was so mad at you for making me cry on an airplane. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, just furious. Um, but it's something I noticed um, because it's, you do the same thing that I was even talking about with um, regard to the story I talked about with Joy, which is like how, characters move around stories and because I think it's so significant to character like how characters interact with other characters is how we learn so much about them right not what the character mm -hmm. itself like they tell us but like how they interact with others tells us the most and I think you do such an amazing job in this collection and just as a short fiction writer with showing us who people are through the lack of a missing person right mm -hmm. a person who maybe has like is is dead or is just not there hasn't shown up like the lack that's there is like a, a running through line through many of these stories and is just so impressively embedded I, I mean we especially see that in Volcano House I think with the two sisters um this idea of like you know what it what it would be to like have this like very meaningful relationship and then have it be you know kind of cut yeah so I wanted to ask you like in writing this specific collection and writing this beautiful book what like the idea of like a missing character or somebody who is like just the the kind of like uh I was thinking about it so much in terms of like the physical body but like right a tooth that's fallen out but you're worrying like at the hole there yeah. like, you're worrying yeah. at the place where it should be and like so it's a constant touching of what's not there so I wanted to ask you about that and yeah. a lot about putting that in the book that's a that's a beautiful question. I mean, I think a lot of the stories in some ways are orbiting absence or orbiting a character who's not there anymore. And I think so much about sort of the shape and energy of uh, that 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 specific absence has like generated in in the the POV character's life. Like I think sometimes when we talk about absence, we think of it as sort of an, an emptiness or a nothingness, um, and that's not really my experience with absence at all. I mean, I think of absence as being such a forceful presence, you know? Um, and and, and the, the, the sort of nothingness is maybe a part of that presence, but it really, ha it's like a weather system, I feel absence is. Um, and it has its own mem memory and energy. Um, and, and I think it can, it can sort of, the absence of a person can shape how we understand the relationship um, as much as a, a presence can, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I think that often this, this like, <laughs> could get very circular, um, but I think that, you know, there's also this often like the absence comes with this, you know, feelings of kind of this like undertow of regret because of course the difference is like, we can't, um, if there's things in the relationship that maybe we would want to rectify, like there's this sense that we missed our chance, right? Um, and so that act of like casting back in memory, that space of sort of re -re resurrecting the past through memory, that space of longing. Um, and yeah, just the idea that, that an absence is not um, a non-presence, but it is sort of a presence in its own way. Um, that that's a really compelling idea for me to explore in fiction. Yeah, like a weighty, I think like a weightiness to it is that I, I definitely see in this in this in this collection just the way that the through line it runs through is so compelling to me and it's yeah so, okay I yeah. know you can talk with other people too. I know this is amazing though thank you <laughs> thank you so much. 
Okay. Okay. I don't know. We don't really know what happens now. We know that Danielle is coming. <laughs> coming. Thank you, Laura. <laughs> hey. Um, I feel like I I'm the host of the like most amazing talk show ever. It's like short story, short no, story. I'm so excited to get to hang out with all of you. Um, okay, so my question for you is about time. Um, a lot of my favorite stories feel really sweeping immense despite their brevity, and I feel like your work totally has that quality. Like, I'm thinking about um, your story, Happily Ever After, which is in um, your forthcoming collection, The Office of historical corrections and that's for everyone listening it's such an amazing collection and you should just do yourself a kindness and pre-order it for your future self like right right now um but in happily ever after like a tremendous amount of time and experience unfolds and it's less than 20 pages um and it's just kind of like wondrous how you move through time in that story um how do you how do you think about time in short fiction? How do you approach time in short fiction? Yeah, thank you. Um, I've been talking about this a lot lately. So I think one of the things that makes the short story form for me feel compressed and expansive is the way that you can be in the past, present, and future at once. And I feel like the moments in the story which manage to bring all of those time frames together are often the most intense. The spaces where like time transitions really quickly. Um, I tell my students sometimes to think of the story form like a skyscraper, right? Like maybe you can't go very far, you're in some sort of fixed point, but like you can get anything from any floor you need to, right? You can always sort of, and I think those moments when you feel the need to like leave the present action and give us a memory or give us a glimpse of the future um, are often really important. And I think they're really important because they're the spaces that make a story feel like a feeling feels, right? Like our, our most intense emotions, like grief or regret or, or even love, like they require us to be simultaneously present in all of those zones, right? There's this intense emotional experience you're having in the present moment, but then there's also a desire to kind of return to the past and construct a kind of narrative of the past that serves the present feeling. And it's also about the future, right? Like grief is about all of the years you're gonna be without somebody. Yeah. Regret is about all of the years you're gonna be the person who did this thing. Love is about all of the, the ways you have to reimagine the future as with a new attachment, right? And so I think when you can manage to bring those together on the page, like it creates a profound emotional experience for the character that hopefully echoes for the reader. So it's a question of, of how to move through time in those spaces where something needs to reverberate or where you can't necessarily kind of filter out, this happened now, but is also always happening and also always will be happening. Like those are the sort of things we're trying to distill in the story form. Yeah, I love the skyscraper metaphor. That's really, that's beautiful. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm tempted to cheat and like ask that question right back to you because like I'm always amazed by how like brilliantly you're able to just like give us this like tiny glimpse of the future and it like recast the whole story and it's exactly what we needed and it, it never feels like out of place. And you do it in so many of these stories in ways that just sort of make everything feel that much more interesting and complicated. But I won't cheat. I have another question for you, um, which is there's this really wonderful kind of shared quality of these stories is that they feel otherworldly, that they're sometimes we're not sure, the characters are often not sure how much to trust their own perceptions or sense of experience. Sometimes we're not sure how much to trust their own narration. But most of the time it, you acquire this sort of otherworldly quality without actually breaking any of the rules of the world as we might understand them. Like some things might be unlikely, but like the strangeness of them is the characters are experiencing the strange, that's part of what's creating a sort of sinister atmosphere. So we're not experiencing them as impossible. And there are a few stories where the kind of, the rules feel like they go a step beyond and something is actually, we're, we're aware that something otherworldly is actually happening or something at least kind of, I don't know, stranger than our normal strange, although I don't even know what our baseline for strange is anymore these days. Um, and so I'm wondering like in your own writing process, when do you know the rules of a story? Like when do you know, or it, when do you decide kind of what's, possible for the world of a story and how much of that the character is going to understand? Yeah, that's, a, that's an amazing question. And, um, I mean, for me, writing is so much about frequency, right? And I 
about it like it's like turning the dial on a radio you know and you're like no no it's static no bad country music and you're just like spinning spin, kind of spinning the dial in the draft stage and I, I think for me frequency is sort of a collaboration between voice perspective um world tone but ultimately I think the frequency dictates the sense of reality so like in there's a story called your second wife about a woman who is like a gigger and one of her gigs is impersonating um dead wives for bereaved weird bereaved husbands and i mean i think in that story like reality is sort of super heightened in because it has a kind of satirical edge to it um and i i think like her the frequency of like the work she was doing sort of guided me um into that heightened reality but then sometimes like it's kind of a surprise which is the most maybe um like beautiful and horrifying thing about writing the the ways in which you know our own kind of worlds can surprise us because um in slumberland i mean that really did sort of start in a more naturalistic vein and i kept thinking that um it would stay in a more naturalistic vein and and yet, like, the frequency of the story and the frequency of the voice kept telling me about this woman who's out taking night photographs and there's stuff going on in her life and she has this neighbor that, like, cries like she's in a Greek tragedy all night and she's just trying to, like, get the hell out of her apartment to get away from this neighbor who she can hear sort of screaming through the walls. And, um, and, and I really did sort of see that initially as kind of a more naturalistic story, but without, without saying exactly what happens in the story, like the frequency kept telling me like, there's something there with the camera, there's something there with the camera. And sure enough, like when I wrote into that moment, you know, this sort of portal opened that, um, that brought me into a fantastic space. Um, and I, I mean, I am so drawn to like fantastic literature and speculative literature as a reader. Um, but I also think that, um, and I think that there's a, there's a very particular kind of strangeness and disorientation that that literature is like uniquely equipped to, um, to access. But at the same time, like our world is so strange. Our lives are so strange. And I think that there's, um, I feel this, there are a lot of Floridians in this, yeah, that, that you, you will be seeing tonight. And I think, um, you know, it's this Florida, right? I mean, I, I think the, the presence of like the deeply, deeply strange in, in the kind of mundane, um, I, I mean, that is so aesthetically like formative for me as a writer. And I'm sure the, the inclination to kind of look at that as carefully as possible um, has to do with place as well. Thank you. And thank you for letting me crash this Florida party as a person oh. from a very normal place of DC. <laughs> yeah, to totally normal. Nothing weird. Nothing strange happening there. <laughs> thank you so much, um, Danielle. That was, that was a beautiful question. Um, and I think the next person who will like, magically appear um, is Karen Russell. Yes, Karen? can you hear me, Laura? I can hear you. Yes, you were muted there for Amazing. a second. Amazing. Amazing. Sure. Thank you for, first, thank you for writing this totally incredible book and also for arranging this game show that we can only win. You know, I think this is like my dream of a game show. I see that there are like so many people in the crowd, but I can't see them with my eyes. So I don't feel like the usual onslaught of anxiety. Like, you know, we're, it feels so cozy for 2D, I think. Uh, and I am just admire all the other writers here so much. And um, yeah, thank you. Uh, it was such a pleasure to read this collection. Thank you so much, Karen. And I wish we were like all here um, in, we were all together in person, but like the airline miles that would have required, this is, yeah, this is like, it's true. This is the this is better for the carbon footprint. <laughs> this is a, this is like the eco eco friendly version mm -hmm. um, of this of this event. So I think um, actually Danielle's question for me is kind of a segue into what I wanted to ask you, which is like you do such an amazing job of building these really like fantastic. Um, speculative worlds in your short stories. And one of the things, one of the many things that I, I love and admire about your stories is how immersive 
the worlds are despite their relative um, brevity. And so, I, yeah, I wanted to ask, um, like, how do you think about world building in the short form and how does it differ? This is like a possible question to answer. How does it differ from how you think about world building in the novel since you do both so brilliantly? Oh, sure. Um, you know, uh, I, that's such a great question. And I do think that's, in some ways, it's like a, such a nerdy pleasure. And it's one of the chief pleasures for me is I have this, this little three-year-old now and he spends like the entirety of his day just making up stories. And so it's from this vantage, I can really see there's so much child joy just in seeing what you can make live. And so a lot of it for me, I mean, really, it's, I think it really is like not a, the most sophisticated pleasure probably, but like, it's so fundamental. I think just sort of like, what can you make live on paper? Um, and that's what, you know, I think like I wanted to write because I, you know, books were so life-saving for me and that was the magic that they did. It was like this world that you, you had this tiny portable universe that you could carry around with you. And then I also think, you know, there's a funny way where if something is like in some sleight of hand, like slightly altered universe, so you know, like Key West, but maybe like four degrees west of Key West, or, you know, I rarely set anything in Miami proper where I grew up. It has to be, you know, uh, reconfigured or there's wolves or ghosts or, you know, um, something, something's dilated. Um, so then I feel like I, it, it's my world. I feel like a little more freedom to imagine into it, I think. And there's sort of, um, yeah, I, I sort of, what I love about stories too is that sense that they have an ongoing life. So that once like the action that you've been so lucky to like view through like the keyhole is complete, you, you, you know, the, if, if a story works, I think you retain that sense that, and I feel this with every story in your collection, Laura, you know, you, you really did just get to eavesdrop on sort of this, this narrow band of sort of a wavelength that is ongoing, you know, and um, I love that kind of vertigo, um, you know, and, as, and get, getting access to that. Um, and I think, you know, I was talking with Kevin Brockmeyer. He has um, written this amazing book of uh, stories that's coming out in the fall, um, uh, Ghost Variations. Oh my God, I hope that's the title. I'm so brain dead. <laughs> Sorry, but it's like a hundred ghost stories. I mean, like what a baller move, like a hundred one page ghost stories. And I was like, my friend, this seems like a lot of work to set up an entire world a hundred times. And he was like, and so it was. But he was saying, you know, um, I'll just read this too, because I thought it was so brilliant. He said, the act of making fantasy embodies a truth that fantasy expresses that the world is something other than we think it is. And so I love your answer about sort of like having a way to access the deep strangeness of things that were in year two the rest of the time. As for like, a story versus a novel, I just think I'm commitment shy. So it's a <laughs> terrible bind where like, I wanna like build the whole world, but like, do I wanna stay there? Maybe not. So <laughs> the story is well suited to this dilemma. Um, and also some of the wilder conceits, like you wouldn't wanna live for 300 pages with like, you know, Madame Bovary's dog or, uh, you know, I mean, some of these people, they get into some real hellscapes. So I'm happy to like make a hellscape and then you know, ask for the check and move on to the next yeah. one. Yeah. Um, I think, I think, I mean, in honesty, like that's part of the, the pleasure too, is sort of in a story collection also, you get to have all those, like uh, Kristen was saying, these snow globe universes and, and constellate kind of an archipelago of, um, of other landscapes. Yeah, yeah, I, th I feel that so much too. And it allows for like experimentation, right? And like, frequency and uh, voice and world in form mm -hmm. without sort of being like, oh, could, could I, could I, should I sustain this for right. 200 plus pages, which is so liberating, right. right? It is so liberating. You're like, all right, so I hung out with these dead people for a time and now <laughs> just when yeah. we're all getting claustrophobic, yeah. I must go. Um, it's, yeah, there, there's a real kind of, sort of pr promiscuous pleasure to the story form, I think. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, you, you, you semi answered my question, I think, uh, when Danielle was asking her, her wonderful question. Um, uh, but I was so struck, you know, this collection felt really different to me, Laura. There's so, it, it's so completely haunted. Um, and even if the, the supernatural elements are not always um, 
at the foreground, but there are some stories like Slumberland, which I think is my absolute favorite here and one of my favorite stories ever. Um, and I was thinking a little bit about the appeal of ghostliness. And I think you do this very particular kind of vertigo, the Laura Vandenberg vertigo, um, mm -hmm. that it, in, on the one hand, you feel so in control of your own effects as a writer. And, and yet I think like paradoxically, so much the pleasure is like feeling the bottom fall out from under you. And it's a shock that feels encoded on the sentence level. So I was wondering about that. And you answer that a little bit, just the degree to which you set things up so that the ghosts can ambush you in the drafting process. I think one of the reasons I loved Slumberland, which is a story about a photographer in like this night world of Florida in this true purgatorial space, kind of skulking around the periphery of other people's stories um, and having a secret, you know, guarding something that feels like this untold story. And then, and then it opens like a locket. You discover something living and terrifying inside it. I don't want to give anything away, but I just wondered about a little bit those twin poles sort of both feeling like, oh my gosh, the self is absolutely unstable. It could dissolve at any second. I might wander out of earshot of my own voice on the one hand. And then on the other hand, a ghost is something that endures. Um, and like on a societal level, on an individual level, you know, a memory that just haunts relentlessly, or you have this amazing line, um, you were supposed to be nothing or you were supposed to be free. Something that just persists um, in spite of your best efforts to contain it or repress it. And, and I just, I, you know, with, I thought we could talk a little bit about the appeal of ghosts, what you can see in that spectral lighting that you wouldn't see in like a strictly realist tale. Yeah, I mean, I think like, one of the most important questions for me to ask of a work of fiction that is in like process is what is happening in this story that can't be bound by language, um, which might in some ways seem paradoxical because language is like the only tool as writers that we really have to communicate, but which is to say like what can't be bound by sort of direct expression, like what has to be kind of animated in in the world um and to that end like i think every story every narrative we need multiple ways to communicate meaning um the the same sort of channel of communication like can't necessarily i think get that like both the bound and the unbindable material um and i think ghosts are like a very particular and very evocative sort of narrative or artistic technology for getting at that unbindable material i mean i think ghosts sort of specialize in what the matter that's been um, ignored, repressed, overlooked. Um, and that can, you know, that matter can and does exist on so many levels, you know, the personal, the communal, the historical, etc. Um, and I think because in our own lives and also like in, in our communities and in sort of, and in history and in our country, um, there's so much of that matter all around us um, that 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 sort of that that un that is unaddressed, um, unacknowledged, um, you know, willfully ignored, and and the ghost can be the presence in the world that just sort of says, you know, like you will you will ignore me, you will ignore me no longer, um, and can force characters into collisions that they would strenuously avoid if they possibly could. Um, and so I think that there's, you know, a tremendous amount of like tension and energy there. I also think I'm kind of like the fairy tale in some ways, when you think about like, how has the fairy tale been with us for so long? There's this sort of like endless flexibility and mutability to the fairy tale. And I think the same is true for the ghost story. Um, like to me, like a, potent sort of su supernatural story like does does deal with the unaddressed in some capacity but that can take so so very many different shapes um there's this really um you know this immense kind of flexibility with the form and i think that that is something that i found really exciting too kind of coming at the speculative um, in, in a myriad of different ways, right? Like sometimes there's like a literal ghost and sometimes I come at it in more of a sideways fashion. Um, but that was it, yeah, that was a beautiful question. Amazing, thank you, Laura. Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, okay, our, our pen ultimate, yay! <laughs> Apple preset. 
everybody should make sure you're checking out where to find this. This is Mike. Can you hear me? Is this is okay. Yes. All right. Um, hi, Laura. Hi. I love your book. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this. And I was just thinking how this could actually never happen in real life because we'd all like, there would be no way that our schedules would allow this. And now it's like, cool. we have nothing to do except sit around and panic um, <laughs> about things. Um, but yeah, this is the congratulations on this. This is really wonderful. And thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah. thank you. Um, so I wanted to ask you about um, endings in short stories. Uh, I feel like endings in short stories are super demanding. Like there's so many novels where I'm like, yeah, it kind of fell off at the end. It's sort of like lost its way at the end, but I still like really, really deeply love this book. Um, but I, I don't often or maybe ever find myself saying that about short stories um it's it's kind of like like the whole the end um like it's like everything you know kind of hinges on the end in a way that i actually don't think is entirely the case for for the novel um i think you write incredible endings which is why i i wanted to pose this question to you um from your debut collection, like the end of um, Men Who Punched Me in the Face, um, which is also an incredible title, uh, is an ending that I still think about like all the time, even though it, it's a story that I read, a, a story that I read a while ago and has been with me for a while and an ending that I think about a lot still. Um, so how do you, like, I guess this is a two part question, Maybe kind of globally, you think makes for a really um, resonant ending in a short story and how do you think about endings when you're working in the short form? Yeah um, so okay two-part question I think the first to answer the first part of it about what sort of globally makes for a solid short story ending I feel the same way as you and I think that stories live and die by their endings and I know when I'm like reading a story, I find myself kind of like holding my breath and being like, come on, can you stick the landing? I mean, it makes me think of like the Olympics and like the yeah, time, like, like just, you've got to stay in the thing. And if the line goes out, it's all ruined and your score will be blown, right? So sort of that sort of pressure that I feel when I'm reading, even if it's just reading a story for the first time, right? Um, and I think what appeals to me is a sense of, uh, of the story feeling like, like it's taking your breath away at the end, right? But that there's also a sense that it isn't ending at all that it's just the end of some phase in that character's experience or life and they're about to set off into something something else and you're right in that in-between spot. So globally, that's kind of what I look or hope for in, in an ending. Um, I noticed, I, I love so many of the endings in your book because they, they sort of, they bring the power of the whole story to bear just on that last moment. Um, and you also, you, you do in some of the stories, what, to answer the second part of your question, right, which is like, what do I do? I, I have noticed that I sort of just like, I sort of like say, and then here's an action, and then I like run away, right? Like I just, <laughs> like, I sort of, uh, I don't know if it's a dodge, but it doesn't, I don't really end a lot on like images, but I end a lot on actions that uh, maybe follow or, or, or like there's an implied image that comes after it. And I just really admire the way how in your stories, they, they're not afraid to, to revisit the story's most powerful moments and remind the reader how much those things should linger, right? Um, so I found myself sort of studying your endings and also something that Danielle brought up when, when you guys were talking about how uh, your stories also manipulate time near the end in order to give the ending um, even more weight. And they, they sort of loan it that sense of, of how life will continue, right? Like we know we're ending one moment in that character's life, but life goes on so much. So or life goes on past that moment for them. And you've sort of given us like, in many of the stories, a preview to that. Um, also, okay, so something I really love too about endings, and um, I think it's interesting that all of us have mentioned a favorite, a different favorite story in this book, which speaks to the power of so many of the stories. Like, I'm not gonna lie, like, you know, you write a book and you, you kind of put that one story in that you're like, eh, it's not my best one, but I needed a number to hit a certain word count and that one. There's not a single one of those in this that I just was like, oh, I should need, they're all fantastic. Um, my favorite, I think, or the one I keep thinking about is the pitch. And without ruining the ending for that, it's that you, you really definitely like, in sort of like the second movement and the opening of that story, mention, mention something, right? Mention something that's never happened for the character. Mm -hmm. And then the end revisits that. And I just remember being like, mic drop, right? Like, 
the, like it, an action happens and then you just run away, right? But not in a fearful way, just a way of like, holy shit. Um, so I really love, I really love what you do in the end of that story too. So thank you for continuing to be one of our teachers on how to nail endings um, and stay in the mat and get like the perfect 10 in the Olympics. Uh, yeah. Was it out of five? I don't know, but you know what, you get it. Yeah, it is, it is stressful. I'm just now thinking of like, right, because they can do this like amazing like gymnastic performance and it's like somersaults and vaulting and you're like, human body can do this, this is incredible. And then it's like, if they land and like wobble for a second, it's like all over. Oh, well, um, well, but yeah, I, mean, I feel like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is a little bit like, I, yeah, I feel that sort of anxiety when I'm sort of feel like the ending looming up where I'm like, yeah. oh, yeah, don't, don't wobble. Um, <laughs> that heel inside the line. Uh, yeah. Or else your career's over. <laughs> it's not um wait so i have a question for you and i'm i'll 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 take it i'll ask the florida question um except not really I, i'm asking in a broad way that i think is instructive to any writer that hopes to conjure a place and um i'll come clean and say that you and i were we had the hopes of doing a panel about this at awp and then we didn't get a chance to do it and i i i think as, as I think your answer will be different from what you might have said before the pandemic to what you're saying now. Um, so I kind of want, I'm like really interested to hear what you're going to say, but I'm wondering how you approached writing about a place that you know intimately, but that it's been quite some time since you've lived there. And, you know, I'll throw in that, like, I'm asking for a friend, but it's, you know, it's me. Um, and just how much Florida is part of these stories, but it's not the sort of flashy Florida man bullshit that I think audiences like in a lot of ways have come to expect and that we even sort of see as a joke for ourselves um but the stories are still somehow it's almost like florida haunts the stories like maybe it's another ghost that's sort of lingering here um so i'm just sort of wondering like i know that the right the reason you avoid the cliche of it is because you're a phenomenal writer uh but i'm wondering how you manage to evoke a sense of home in a place like in a way when you like how do you not like, are you relying on memory on that? Like, how are you constructing that now that you haven't lived there for some time? Yeah, that's a great question. I think I, I, I don't know that I have like a crafty answer to that. I think my answer probably is more personal. I mean, I, I think similarly to you, like I lived in Florida, I was born in Florida, I lived in Central Florida, I lived there until I was in my early 20s. And then when I left, um, I was, yeah, when people are like, why did you get an MFA when you did? And I was like, I had to move. <laughs> like, I had to move out of Florida. <laughs> like, there's no, really no other reason. That, that was like the, the, main, the main reason. And this was sort of a, like, a, like, a, like an exit ramp, you know, um, that, that I could make sense of and like my family could make sense of. And um, I think for a lot, so at first I went through this phase, like I didn't want to write about Florida at all. I just wanted to be like, just, just, just like pull the completely. Um, and then sort of around my second collection and like my first novel ends in the keys, I started to revisit the state on the page, but it was not so much the parts of Florida that I am from. I either went north or I went south mm -hmm. and just kind of like studiously avoided the middle part. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, I mean, I think for me, the answer is it's complicated. I think that, um, I think it just, I just needed time. You know, I think for some writers, like they leave home and, and immediately home is so sort of like freshly multidimensional to them because they're in that space of remove and they're in that space of longing. And that did happen to me ultimately, but it took like, over a decade. Um, and I think even for a long time when I would try and do sort of descriptive exercises around like Central Florida, like it was, it was just like trying to describe like a painting while I was standing with like my face pressed to the canvas. Like I just couldn't, I couldn't see the specifics of the place. So I think it took time in terms of perspective. Um, I also think I had a real sort of dismissiveness and I, I totally also, though a Floridian had been guilty of like performing the Florida caricature and being the person at the party who's like, who wants to hear all my weird reptile stories? Um, yeah, and who wants to hear about the gators? 
and like, you know, surely that is a part of the place, but it's not, um, you know, it's not ultimately like the defining feature um, of, of the place. Um, and so that was something that like I had to think about, like how is I actually sort of performing the, the, cl the cliches and, and like what was I, what was that performance trying to get away from? Um, and I think like, I think in a lot of ways for me, Central Florida for a long time felt like a site of trauma um, and that there was sort of like healing that needed to happen in its own space and its own time. And I think as a like natural defense mechanism, I had long talks with my therapist about all of this. Um, you know, there was the performance piece and also this sort of dismissiveness. Like, why, why, do, why do I wanna, you know, learn more about this place? Why do I want to, you know, why do I want to like hear what my family has to say about this place? Like I had a real sort of dismissiveness about like the incredible sort of like fascinating complex history that that resides here and I think once like healing happened mm -hmm. um like sort of openly have like respect and interest in the place again like art artistically and just like as a human being and I started to spend more time here and it like my whole orientation now I've I am in Florida now I've been here um since March um, and I've been, you know, spending time. I'm so excited to talk to people that I'm not related to. Like, I can't even tell you. <laughs> um, but yeah, like I, I, now, you know, my sister and I went on a hike in like a cypress swamp and I'm like, this is incredible. This is like something out of a science fiction novel, except it's like real and I can look at it. And it's like 10 minutes away. How cool. Um, and you know, I, it, it just took like a really long time to sort of be able to see this this sort of dimensionality of place. Um, but I I feel like I'm there now, and I I'm glad to be there. Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic answer, and it, it's it's interesting to hear that it didn't come from like a longing for it, right? That that it was it's quite the opposite, and that now your relationship to it is it seems very healthy. Um, and so of course, yeah. Like, yeah, I think it, it felt like this, like, I remember when I first moved away and I'd come back and visit family, I would have these horrible, like, sweat-soaked nightmares that I'd, like, lost my driver's license if there was some reason that I wouldn't be able to, like, leave again. So I think this feeling of, like, this is a place that, <laughs> like, I, like, it was like a trap, you know, and it was something I was constantly kind of trying to get free of. Um, I think when that feeling went away, um, and I was like, no, no, this is just a place. Like the problem was never the place. The problem was was me and my own issues. Like as soon as like I was able to kind of shed that feeling or heal that feeling, it's like my relationship to the place changed like so holistically. Yeah. Um, I think the state is proud to claim you as one of its writers. So uh, thank you for, for being one of them. <laughs> Um, thank you so much. And our last um, amazing artist, writer, human uh, is Lauren Brock. Hi. Hey, I just want to say I'm like over brimming with love tonight just because I love every single person on this panel. I love you so much. And I love so many people who are in the chat um, saying hi. This is just like a, like a festival of how, your amazing beauty bringing the world together. Thank you, Laura. This is incredible. Um, hi. <laughs> hi. It's so good. And this is a beautiful yeah. book. I love it. It's so good. And you're in your square. Um, you were, so, okay, so the last question, um, for, for, for you is you did this, so you did this incredible act of, you were early reader for Wolf, and you did this incredibly generous thing where I asked you to read, because I was really stuck on the order, and I, I think I was thinking about the order super literally, like, I was like, maybe the story called Last Night should be last, because it's called Last Night, <laughs> and you were like, or it could be first, um, and you, you basically, like, reordered the entire collection for me, and, and, and no one changed anything about the order after that. Um, it, it was this like such such a generous generous thing um, so it was something I've been really stuck on and it got sort of remembering that 
before the event got me thinking about how like in my favorite um, collections, like a really cohesive world is created. And, um, and it's a world, like even if the stories aren't interconnected in the way they would be in like a linked story collection, it's a world that totally has its own, own sort of logic and its own weather system. Um, and I think your, both your collections um, have that quality so very much. And Florida especially has its sort of, even though not all the stories are, are set in Florida, like has this really beautifully realized kind of weather system that we, we move through. And so since I will like forever think of you as the, it's like the sh short story, the macro structure, like master, um, who totally like saved my butt when I was so stuck on the order of my own book. How, how do you think about putting together a story collection? Like decisions like what stories to put in, what stories to take out, like where, what story do I start with? Like, can you like take us through your process for shaping um, a collection as a whole? Sure. Um, well, thank you. Uh, it was such a pleasure to read your book early on. And I read all the stories as they were coming out, too. So I, I sort of knew the collective Laura Vandenberg. So I sort of knew what you were haunted by, right? And I think that um, architecture is the most exciting thing about putting a short story collection together. And it's not just the visible architecture of story by story by story, which is really important, right? You don't wanna put like a three third person stories and then like a chunk of first person stories just because it'll be monotonous, right? So that part, that's a level that is really interesting to pay attention to. But the things that are really, really exciting are paying attention to the, the music underneath the surface, almost the things that you're listening for that aren't visible to the eye. And in fact, when you sit down to write about what each story is about, you, it wouldn't even come up in the top 20 things. But you're listening for that as you're reading sort of collectively. And then when you find that, you sort of find an argument, right? So, so the first story needs to be a posited argument that the next story takes and sort of shifts a little bit. And I feel like the growth through the course of a short story collection has to be sort of a shifting of the argument in ways that are unexpected and interesting. And then you come to the end, the last story is the most important story, I think, in a short story collection, because it does what all good books do. And yours like makes me so excited that you put that one last, because what it does is it takes all of these separate arguments, all of these separate songs sort of happening underneath the surface of each individual story. And it doesn't necessarily shut the door on those. It's not like a crisp closure, but what it does is sort of fragments all of those arguments, all of those stories into multiple different ways. And it sort of opens up a whole separate section that I didn't even until I read that story and was like, oh yeah, that's definitely the last story. I didn't even know that you were sort of subtly arguing toward that until that, that story. So you have to pay attention to, to the larger sort of very workaday ideas that are happening overtly. And then you have to think about sort of the musicality and the, and the things that are happening under the surface too. And it's so much fun. Like I actually sit there with my lists and I'm like, oh my gosh, so this story is actually speaking to this story in a really interesting way and they need to, they need to be juxtaposed and it's, it's like, it makes me so happy to do. Yay. Okay, so I have, <laughs> I have a question for you and it's the, the latest question of the night. It's not, you know, it, I think we're all like giddy and um, tired. Um, but my question for you is about this you wrote this one essay, uh, and I don't, don't know how many years ago, but it stuck with me. It's about the wolf that your own family had, and um, <laughs> her name was Natasha, and you, she was raised in Florida. And I'm thinking about this, this essay as I was reading this collection for um, the, this past time, and I was thinking, you know, in a certain way, it's your sort of totem animal, right? And I want to know how this ghostly wolf became your storytelling soul, which is such a weird question, but answer. So, no, I, 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 this is, I, this is a, a, an amazing question. Um, so my parents who love animals and were slash are a little eccentric um and they both grew up on farms so there was like no animal that was 
necessarily off limits to have in one's home. Um, brought a wolf cub home uh, when I was like, it's gonna make my parents sound like they were really negligent. They like totally weren't. I don't know if they're on this thing, but you, yeah, you did great. Um, <laughs> this is a, yeah, this is a fun, this is a fun story. Um, so they brought this wolf cub home um, and they named her Natasha. I don't have necessarily clear memories of this because I was like, a t I think I was two or so, so I was very, very small. Um, I did not get eaten clearly, which was, that was good. Um, nor did the other animals that were already in the house. Um, but yeah, Natasha, um, she lived with us, I think for a year, like about a year and a half, and um, it did not work out super well. She bathed at the, <laughs> at the moon, <laughs> which upset the neighbors, and she paced like um, a trench in the backyard. So it, my mom said at one point it was so deep that you could only see her from like the shoulder up. And yeah, she was not happy. So she went to go live on a farm and that's not like a euphemism, like she really did. <laughs> so I have been led to believe, go to live on a farm. Um, and so that is what happened with Natasha. But I think like how actually that story has resonance for like my relationship to fiction is it's an iconic the Natasha story is like an iconic story in my family um and it was the uh, one of the first stories that I remember hearing different families tell over and over and over again and depending on who is telling the story like my dad was an amazing storyteller um and he had a wonderful sort of sense of like timing and art like all of the components of a really like compelling story it like he understood those sort of rhythms um so if my dad was telling the story it was sort of one of my brother's faults that they got you know the wolf if my mom was telling the story it was completely my dad's fault <laughs> um if one of my older sisters was telling the story like they had a different perspective and so i think like it was this kind of also amazing lesson in perspective and how perspective shapes story and like that that in some ways like any story is sort of a collision between a, a sort of more objective reality like we all agree that we had a pet wolf no one disputes that as a fact and um and and like the highly subjective internal worlds that we're all carrying with us and so i think in some ways like that i mean just like apart from like the unusualness of being like do you know what's a great idea let's get a wolf at and raise this wolf in a like suburban we didn't at that time we're not living in like a rural area we were living in like just like a regular like suburban neighborhood um like neighbors and everything yeah <laughs> wild. i really wish i had been older so i could like fully absorb this this experience of having a pet wolf um but yeah i mean i think for me it was like kind of like this early lesson in storytelling and perspective that left this like indelible imprint in my brain Yay. <laughs> but you're all like brilliant and generous and amazing and i love you and i love your work and thank you yes for for being here Okay, so I think it's time for the Q and A. Um, thank you first to all of you. That was such a wonderful conversation. I feel like I'm still basking in all of this wisdom. Um, but we have a ton of great questions from the audience. Um, so I'm going to start with one by Nate, who asks: After three short story collections and two novels, have your ideas about what a story can accomplish or be changed? What did you believe, what, what, what do you, or no, yes, sorry. What did you believe made a good story when you wrote your first book and have those ideas changed over time? Yes, <laughs> I think it would probably, yeah. I'll try and like, like distill my thoughts on exactly how, I think a couple of like specific things that I was thinking about with this collection. 
Um, in my last collection, The Isle of Youth, all the stories are pretty long. Um, and so sort of like what I was saying to um, Danielle, like I, I love stories that have this sort of feeling of immensity and this big sweep of time. Um, and I, I felt like I'd had a sense of maybe how to get some of that breadth if I had 30 pages. Um, but I also wanted to see just this kind of a form challenge, like if I could accomplish that kind of breadth in 10 pages. And if I could, what, how would structure need to change? How would time need to change? How would movement um, need to change? And, uh, you know, that's something in terms of form that I was thinking about quite a lot. Um, I, I was also thinking, you know, I, I, I have had, had wonderful teachers when I was in grad school. Um, I, at the same time, I do think the kind of prevailing attitude, or at least what I absorbed, is that we always wanted to be subtle in our work and kind of, you know, err on the side of understatement. Um, and I was, I really wanted to push myself sort of away from that. I think like, what, what we respond to like, quote unquote, unsubtlety in a negative way, there's like a perceived lack of complexity, but I actually wanted to write stories that were in some ways more direct, um, and in some ways perhaps even like blunt, um, without sacrificing complexity, without sacrificing like a multitude of, of dimension. Um, and that I, I think, you know, reflects a sort of maybe somewhat of a shift in my like orientation as a reader, but that that is something that I was thinking about a lot with this, um, with this uh, collection writing. Um, it's not true for all the stories, but in a couple of stories, um, I was, you know, I really wanted to bring a sort of directness and an explicitness um, on to the, you know, to bear on the page without undermining the complexity of the world. I love that. That was a wonderful answer. Um, okay, I think we have time to squeeze in one more question. So I'm going to go with um, something in a little bit of a different direction. Um, Michelle asks, who are your short fiction models? Oh my gosh, so, so many. Um, so I was so happy uh, that um, Kristen brought up um, Joy Williams, who I love Joy Williams' work and, and she is someone I'm always kind of looking, looking towards. Um, I think, I'll talk about um, a couple of writers maybe because there are like so many people that I could cite. I, I, I could keep us here like all, all night and yeah, just rattling off names and nobody, nobody wants that. Um, there were a couple of writers that like were hugely helpful to me while working on this book in particular. Um, Yun Lee's I think is one of our, and that came out this, um, the, the, uh, we had the same pub date, which was like so, such an honor, but, uh, um, so she had a novel that came out uh, yesterday. I think she is one of my greatest living story writers and she does wild stuff with time. Um, and I was reading her collection a lot when I was working on Wolf and, and, and really sort of admiring just the, the like balls out leaps that she would take um, with, with time. Uh, and, and it was like, and so unexpected. It's like, you think you're like, you know, you're kind of going along and you feel like you know what the story is doing and then all of a sudden like, boom, it's like you are way in the future or way, you know, or way in the past, you make some sort of unexpected time cut. Um, I think the same is true in a lot of ways for um, Edward P. Jones, like Lost in the City is one of my most like heart held um, collections. And I think he also in some ways has, has a very like storytelling sensibility, but it's like quietly super experimental um, with, with time and structure and perspective. Um, and also breaks like all of the conventions that maybe we hear at some point. Like you can't, ch if you're in one point of view, you can't change point of view right at the end and he's like can't I like because I'm going to and and it will be amazing um and then the last collection that I'll talk about uh is um I love Dennis Johnson's posthumous collection uh, Largesse of the Sea Maiden and the title story in Triumph Over the Grave 
were so influential for some of the stories that are told in a more fragmentary way and span a lot of time. I loved how, um, I, I lied, there's one more collection I'm going to talk about. I was, I was going to say, I love how um, capacious those stories are and how in some ways like there is this kind of looseness to them. Like, like a compression and an economy is a natural sort of part of the short story form, but I also kind of reject the idea that in a short story like everything has to be like an arrow sort of pointing to the central meaning of the story and there's this like incredible sort of um, looseness and like and fearlessness about just taking sort of one's time uh, that's really different from Jesus' Son, which also is an incredible collection. And I think this, I feel very different kind of writer, very different stylistic orientation, but um, Helen Oyemi's um, story collection, What Is Not Yours Is Not Yours, I feel like she's that too. Like there's some of the stories in that book that I teach and that I really love and there, there are moments in their scenes that remain deeply uh, mysterious to me. And I, I'm like always trying to kind of connect them back to the whole, but it's not a diminishment, um, but rather a, a sort of like invitation deeper into these like amazing, fantastic puzzle box worlds that she builds. So I, as you can probably tell, I'm like, and another, and another, but I will cut myself off there. <laughs>